re-energizing regional destinations through branding and investment to boost tourist arrivals. We'll be welcoming Rajan back on stage to moderate, and we're going to have a particular introduction given by Professor Dimitris Buchalis, who's the director of e-tourism lab and deputy director international center for tourism and hospitality and research at Bournemouth University Business School. Uh, Professor Buchalis will be joining us virtually as he's presently on a visit to Hong Kong. So mindful of the fact that it's past midnight in Hong Kong, we thank him very much for staying up so late to speak, to join us. We'll also be joined by the Honorable Memumatu Pratt, the Minister for Tourism and Cultural Affairs from Sierra Leone. And Mobin, Mr. Mobin Rafiq, who's an investor, entrepreneur, and president of the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club. If we could welcome you on stage. And Mr. Andrew Agius Muscat, Secretary General of the Mediterranean Tourism Foundation. And if we can find him in time, we will be welcoming Mr. Toyub Mohammed, who's the Managing Director, Maldives Marketing and PR Corporation. And we're joined online as well by Ms. Nikolina Angelakova, who is a Member of Parliament in Bulgaria and the former Minister of Tourism. And we're delighted that she too can join us from a distance. So Rajan, I think we're ready. Um, we have Professor Buhalis already on screen. Uh, we're probably waiting to bring in Miss Angela Kova, but she will appear in due course. And she's here, so that's great. Welcome, Angela. <laughs> Nicolina, Hi, welcome. And Thank uh, you. Demetrius, welcome. And ladies and gentlemen here on the stage, welcome indeed. And Rajan, the stage is set for you. Well held. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you um, for this. Now, the main point really about this whole notion of re-energizing regional destinations through branding and, and investments to boost tourist arrivals is that really this phrase, we need to build back better. We do, but we need to build back together. And this taps into the idea of partnerships across national borders. Destination marketing can help jumpstart tourism for certain geographic reasons, uh, regions, sorry. So what strategic direction, this is what I'll be asking you, what strategic direction needs to be taken in terms of investment, destination branding, marketing, and brand communications? We've all got points to make about this, but I'm gonna, as Paul said, we're gonna first get Professor Dimitrios Bohalis to give us a kind of introductory presentation about this, this very point. So over to you, Demetrius. Hi, hi Rajan. Uh, lovely to be with you. That's the first uh, world travel market I miss after 31 years continuously. Uh, I'm currently on sabbatical in Hong Kong, working with Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, and um, of course, uh, things here are very different from what they're in Europe. We're still effectively uh, the, the, the country is uh, closed, people cannot come into Hong Kong and they are very big restrictions towards uh, uh, traveling in China. Um, I think I'd like to, to take it from where Christopher actually left it when you were discussing about uh, the human resources and the talent management of the future because I think that's the major the major issue that we're going to be facing. I think I've been following the entire conference today, and I think a lot of people are, are still trying to go back to 2019, and I, that's, their, uh, that's their preoccupation. But I think we really need to start looking to how can we go forward, re-energize destinations to go towards 2030. And I think that is, we really need to recognize that things have happened in the last two years, that they're going to take us to a different, in a different direction, and they are going to require us to do different things. 
First of all, our consumer would like to come back, our tourists would like to come back, but n- now they are much more technologically savvy. Uh, even people that they have never used technology before, they had to use technology for shopping, they had to use technology for e-banking, they were uh, relying on technology for a lot of different things. So increasingly, they're looking to engage in conversations with destinations using smart tools. And um, it's really critical that the destinations realize that and they fulfill uh, that need by having the infrastructure to operate smartly with operations. Um, we've got a major issue in terms of human resources and talent management. And again, we are expecting uh, uh, people to come and work in an industry that was like 2019. I think uh, the in- people um, increasingly uh, have experienced different industries that they are giving them better compensation and better conditions. And I think we really need to start re-engineering the, the work that we do in tourism and the way that we are co-producing uh, and co-creating value. And it's really critical to start looking to how we can uh, change the structures and the, and the process in a way that will enable people to come and use their talent, uh, uh, learn from what they've got from university and from different industries, and bring innovation in the tourism industry. We really need to start innovating, and we cannot keep repeating the the business model that we had uh, uh, back in the 1980s. So it's it's absolutely critical when we are re-energizing destinations to look into how can we do things differently. What innovations can we do in the process, in the product, and the way that we're distributing products, in the way that we are co-creating value? And how can we get the new talent to actually buy into the new industry and help us transform the industry uh, yeah, for the future? I think these are, these are really, really critical elements that are going to bring us towards 2030. And, and I think those are the most critical uh, uh, paths uh, that they're going to to develop the agenda. So primarily, it's looking to the new consumer, who the new consumer is smart, is connected, is getting uh, involved and likes uh, to uh, have transformative and authentic experiences. And then on the other side, how can we invest on our cons- on on our talent, on our human resources? And I've got to say something. Uh, as I'm the only academic today in in the panels all day is that quite often people are leaving university, they've studied tourism, and they're going into junior positions to be supervised by people who have been working in the industry for 20 or 30 years, and they've got practices from 30 years ago. And somehow we need to, to change that. We really need to empower the new people to, uh, to take advantage of the knowledge and the innovations that are bringing forward and to innovate and, and, and create an entrepreneurial environment to take us forward. Uh, Rajan, I don't think I can, I would like to take more of your time, but I think those are the two critical things I would like to emphasize. Okay, thank you. We're gonna come back to you to react to some of the, the points that are made here. Um, is it possible, by the way, can I ask the technical team? Oh, there they are, they're actually on screen now, great. Um, can I turn to you, actually, uh, Andrew, because I suspect that the Mediterranean Tourism Foundation is not something that many people know about here, but I presume it's actually addressing the very point we're talking about, which is different partnerships happening, basically different countries cooperating together in order to attract tourism together. Can you expand on what the MTF is? Absolutely, Rajan. This, is, this project started about 10 years ago. Uh, it started through an inspiration in, in, uh, when we were attending a meeting in, uh, in Brussels, hot track meeting, which brings together the hoteliers of Europe. And there we could see that the Mediterranean countries within this association, within hot track, they were not really collaborating amongst each other. And that's, this got us thinking, because of course we found, we found it ironic, because when you think about it, international tourism attracts um, uh, one third uh, the Mediterranean attracts one third of international tourism, which, is the, which makes Mediterranean, the Mediterranean region the most important region in the world when it comes to tourism. So we just talk, talk, talked about it, we, we, we challenged each other about it, and we started with a project. Started with a small initiative, but immediately we could see that there was a demand for it. 
because of course, if the customer, if tourists are, are, are asking for the Mediterranean region, of course, then the businessmen will follow suit. Um, uh, one thing leads to the other. We ended up um, today having uh, organizing the most important conference um, uh, in the Mediterranean. Tracks over 1,600 people every year to discuss concrete projects. And this is the trick behind the success of this foundation, of this project. We don't talk about rhetoric. We don't, we don't talk about the potential or what are the issues, or, and we stop there. But we literally bring together the best brains from all over the world to come up with ideas, to create synergies. Of course, um, we talk about synergies in various conferences. We talk about collaborations even in political fora. But nothing beats the people who come together and get things done. Uh, I think the people out there have had enough uh, of hearing politicians, of hearing um, uh, leaders talking about what we can do, but then at the end of the day, when we face the real challenges, like we've just faced a major international challenge, such that of COVID, mm. then we, found, we find ourselves unprepared. So bringing together the people, the best brains from different sectors too, because this is also very interesting. Here, of course, we're talking, um, we, we are participating in a forum targeting the tourism industry. But of course, tourism is not just hotels and restaurants. And, and what we do consciously is that we try to attract the investors coming from the construction industry, for example. I was speaking with, with my colleague Mobin before. Uh, from the construction industry, technology, security, bringing the best brains from different sectors together to come up with solutions. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll, I'll talk to you more about that too in a second. Um, Mobin, who you just mentioned. The Commonwealth. Now, this, you could say, in a very modern 21st century, feels like an old world institution. Uh, Anglophone, um, you know, just a few ex former colonies, not a few, but quite a few former colonies of the UK. How do you see it as being instrumental in re energizing tourism in certain parts of the world? Well, thank you, Rajan. Uh, I think uh, now, as uh, Minister Najib said about SME, Minister Edmund and Minister Naif. So I think, and uh, Minister, Lady Minister uh, Botswana. So they all, I've, I've, I've been listening to them very carefully. And what I noticed is that their main emphasis was on SMEs. Yeah. Now, luckily, all my life I was involved into industry and SME was my passion. Because if you look at SME, 85% in any country you go, SME plays a vital role. Now, where today I notice a little bit of a confusion is that how do you really explain SMEs? Because, you know, you, you cannot be expert you know, not necessary that if you are a minister or somewhere, everyone has got their own specialization, so they probably miss out. So this is what I was just trying to notice that SME is a long subject. It's a very important sector, and without that, you cannot. So your question was that, how do we go about it in the tourism? SME plays an important role. Now, when you talk about tourism, the most important thing is you talk about travel and you talk about hotels. That Now the point is, when you talk about hotels, you, you need SMEs because you need bed sheets, tablecloth, napkins, tables, bed, uh, bedrooms, you name it. So all these things are actually coming from uh, SMEs. Mm. Now, what they all mentioned, and I think the minister will probably will, <laughs> will help me out here, that without, I mean, so what they were talking about is that they need investment, and, but they think that they cannot penalize investors. Now, what, what happened in the, my last 40, 45 years experience in different countries I have seen what government they do is they say okay there is a potential for investment say tourism in our country now investors shy away they understand now you need to attract 
investor to come in and invest. Now, if you impose them that no, you will have to buy the bed sheet, you've got to buy this, 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 this from the first year, is, is probably may create some problem. Mm. But what is important and wise enough to do is that usually government will give them a program that okay, you come and invest and take your money, but in the meantime, in five years time, you develop our SME industry to up to 50-60% level. Certain things, we are a small country, we may not be able to produce it. So 40% you can import it, but 60% so that local people are happy, they will welcome them. So in a sense, I give you an example. One hotel, five star means one textile mill. So you imagine mm. the potential. So I think we'll, we'll discuss about this. Uh, in, in a nutshell, I've explained you. Yeah, I want to return to the Commonwealth though. <laughs> <I see. laughs> and how the Commonwealth can operate in, in, in re-energizing certain countries' tourism uh, levels. You know, Commonwealth is 2.5 billion population. And with a $10 trillion potential, so what happened is that obviously I've, I've been watching this uh, potential of Commonwealth the last 40 years very closely and I thought that uh, it has to go through private sector. So if the governments, the last 40 years the governments tried, so every two, three years they have a big conference, they hug each other, they kiss each other, they do shopping and then they go away and some of the prime ministers been removed, some of the presidents are removed. So I think the business is actually considered to be handled by private sector. So what is the role of the Commonwealth? Tell the me Commonwealth's that. role at the moment is that what we have done is in Commonwealth countries, the potential is already there. The problem is they are not interacting with each other properly. What we are doing now is our main motto, when I started two years ago, our main motto is that Commonwealth Entrepreneur Club is to trade and collaborate within Commonwealth and outside Commonwealth countries to alleviate poverty, to create jobs and help out UK SMEs as well. So what we want is, what we want is that the UK SMEs and the Commonwealth SMEs should work together. There is a great potential. All we need to do is make them sit with each other and they will do business. I mean, you can't teach them any business because they're all business people. So if we can, and this is a major problem where I realize that, uh, so how we are doing it, we've got in two years, we've got around seven, 8,000 members. And uh, the reason is that we are saying that Commonwealth is open to everyone. Now that's interesting. So it doesn't have to be for the Commonwealth countries. Well, uh, I won't stop anybody to do business with Commonwealth country. I mean, we are just saying we are open for business because we've got to change. Yeah. This is a private sector initiative. Yeah. Minister Pratt from Sierra Leone, do, from your perspective, do you regard the Commonwealth as a relevant and, and useful institution that can help re-energize tourism? Um, well, um, we all know that um, some 20 years ago, the Commonwealth was very vibrant. And then over the decades, they have just lost that level of um, arrangements for the 54 Commonwealth members because of the fact that um, there have been dramatic drop in the activities. You know, in fact, when you now talk about Commonwealth scholarship, it's like, it's very, very few. They used to have Commonwealth games and all of those things stopped. So the way I see Commonwealth is that they have, the Commonwealth has to reinvent itself into the current situation in the world in order that they could make themselves very relevant. Because over the years, um, they have been able not to do so many things again to an extent that so many people only know the name. They don't even know what it stood for yeah. or what they used to do. Yeah. So, um, but the Commonwealth has got an opportunity now, especially when we consider now the United Kingdom has gone Brexit and then also there is need for the UK to be able to expand and consolidate its international support 
So there is, this is a very good instrument for the United Kingdom to be able to explore that. But especially when they want to promote things like human rights, you know, when they want to talk about elections, you know, you want to talk about accountability, you want to talk about corruption. And then you also want to talk about supporting girls' education, supporting construction of schools and all of that. So if at the bottom of that, the United Kingdom is very much want to use this in trying to ensure that the 54 Commonwealth become very, very relevant, I believe they have to review and look at their image again and see how that can be situated within the current global arrangements that we have. If not, um, it's going to be very difficult to have a very strong presence to come back. Yeah. But as I say, um, um, there's an opportunity for that. For instance, we're talking about SMEs. You know, these are things which can be promoted for young people in different parts of the Commonwealth country. Um, they can be able to promote uh, more type of um, education, wash facilities. See, I mean, there is strong room for that, but it's going to be quite expensive. Reason being that uh, there is no competition between United Kingdom and many other multilateral agencies, especially now they are out of the EU. And then, of course, on ground, there is going to be struggle to, um, let me say, to reinstitutionalize its existence as it used to be. Mm. But it's a good, it's a very good, it's a very good instrument, I think. And there are huge opportunities around it. But for that to work, there should be lots of partnerships. There should be a um, lot of coordination. And there should be groundwork to be done for the Commonwealth to be much more useful. If we're talking about partnerships, by the way, um, in terms of Sierra Leone, do you have partnerships with other countries in the, in the, in the similar part of the world? And, and yes, there are partnerships, yeah. of course. Uh, partnerships exist at different levels. There are partnerships with um, regional organizations, multilateral organizations, you know, I mean, like the European Union, the United Nations, you know. And then also we have partnerships with specific countries. Of course, you know that you have quite a number of countries that are now moving towards <coughs> Africa. Mm. Of course, you take the China, you know. And now a very strong presence is coming from the Middle East. So it's not, it's not as easy as before. So there are strong partnerships <laughs> coming for private sector development, partnerships coming for supporting things like poverty alleviation, poverty reduction, partnerships in the area of um, providing food for the vulnerable people. Now I know of a UAE organization <laughs> in Sierra Leone that gives, it's called, um, um, is it one billion food? That's the name of the organization. And they go to these communities, they have all of these packages which they give people. So partnerships exist. But the most important partnerships, which I think is very important now to the tourism sector, which I see um, um, we need to talk about. Um, the story is, before COVID, there are many countries that still needed to restart themselves in tourism. Mm? Before COVID. And now uh, we have had COVID, we are in, <coughs> the bigger countries are talking about restarting. So as I watch and you know, and listening, uh, maybe we need to talk about different levels of restarting. Mm -hmm. But to be more specific, I believe um, restarting an investment, I think the first level is the will of the regional and international organizations. Um, that is so paramount in terms of how they can be able to make the commitments and work on certain things which can be able to ensure that tourism starts, starts to grow. And governments, for instance, now we have, we have a challenge <clears throat> with regards to traveling. We want to restart travel. Yeah, we all know people have to be vaccinated. I mean, no two ways around it. Because you say you vaccinate your country, you leave another country, you're only postponing the spread of the infection to another day. So vaccination is one. But the other thing, in the midst of the increase, especially in the first world countries, the developed countries, because they have more people that have been vaccinated, I think there is need for opening up very quickly. Because that alone is an example to many other countries. For instance, um, coming to the United Kingdom, um, 
the number of forms you have to complete, yeah. uh, the too many service providers for testing. The, I mean, that alone is a nightmare. Yeah. Alone is a nightmare. I think that needs to be looked at very, very strongly because there are countries, once they move, the others follow. And we cannot afford to continue like this. Life has to go on. I mean, uh, uh, um, I was talking to someone that in Africa, we have been walking around with yellow fever passports since, uh, since ages. And every day when you go around, why is your yellow fever card? We never saw that as anything. We thought that was a genuine thing which people should do. Mm. So I think restarting has to look at all of this. Seeing how we can look at these challenges. Seeing how the bigger countries can be able to stand up and show the examples. Because people are really trying. And I think like the, <clears throat> for some other government, there is need for investment in the development of other sectors so tourism can thrive. That is critical. Right. Be be because for us in, the, in countries that are poor, mm. um, we look at tourism as a vehicle to drive our development. We know we cannot compete with the large numbers of people coming, but we can use it as a vehicle to move the development. And that is why sometimes I always preach the tourism divide. Yeah? Rich countries, in as much as it's difficult, have to come forward to support very poor countries so that tourism thrives. Because once you do that, domestic tourism answers the questions for poor, for poor countries that cannot bring in the millions of people into their countries. Because it changes the trajectory. Yeah. So I think, I think this is, this is the visas. More arrangements about visas. Countries are now going to visa exchanges, you know, visas on arrival, blah, blah, blah. Cost of visas. Yeah. I mean, these, these are all things which we think it's, it's, it's maybe, but it's something, duration yeah. in people having visas. So, so you're talking about real... I mean, so kind of, these are the real thing about restarting. Yeah. And then the final point will be the travel market, the travel shoes. Just a few weeks ago, we were in um, Tanzania in Arusha, where we witnessed the first East Africa travel yeah. market, which was huge. And I think this is key. So this brings in responsibility of regional organizations. EAC has gone far as reorganizing East Africa. So what about the other regional bodies? I think these are all issues which um, are key, changing the trajectory, the, uh, I mean, the drive towards uh, information, communication, technology. Yeah. I think it's, it's key to, to, to restart the rebranding, changing the brand, or trying to, re, to present something in a different language, and trying to market a problem, not as a problem, well, as a challenge, but then also as an opportunity. As an opportunity. I think it's great to come. as well, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Nicolina, in, Hi, uh, I'm not sure if you are in Bulgaria at the moment, but anyway, when we spoke quite recently, actually, we were talking about your experience when you were the former Minister of Tourism in Bulgaria and how you wanted, you were talking about spreading um, awareness of different parts of the country. So, so it's not just Sunny Beach, for example. It's making sure that the rest of the country also has a part to play and has a stake in tourism. Can you expand on that and, and how that could maybe help in the future re-energize tourism? Uh, good evening to everyone. I'm really sorry I am not uh, with you tonight. Uh, I am in a very beautiful place in one of our oldest ski resorts, Borovet, and I would like to welcome you all here to have your winter holiday. It's really amazing and a very lovely place that I used the opportunity to present to you. And uh, having uh, um, taking the last word of um, um, Rajan that Bulgaria is not only sunny beach, it's true, Bulgaria has uh, variety in different kind of tourism that we could offer and in particular the winter tourism in one of our best resorts like Borovet, Bansko and Pomporovo uh, can bring to the difference we have. But um, experiencing COVID for the past almost two years, we are all confronted with a big challenges and these big challenges are connected not only to improve the different tourism products we offer, 
but also to bring all communities to work together. Because uh, we, I agree with the, with, the, uh, with the minister that we have to use this crisis as an opportunity to strengthen um, all um, our assets in tourism sector. Uh, and I agree with Dimitris that the biggest challenge we have is, are the human resources and the talents that need to be pushed to work in the sector. Because as I always have said, tourism is about people. And we need to encourage uh, people to come back and work in the sector. But this could happen only hand in hand with the government, with the regional communities, in particular regional tourism association, and generally uh, all the players that are working in the sector. And this is how we could use this uh, challenge of COVID-19 to rebrand uh, uh, tourism and to combine uh, the strengths of one of the regions with the strengths of the other and focusing on the health and, and safety that the tourism is offering throughout, uh, uh, throughout the country, for example, here in Bulgaria. But I could go further when we talk about uh, re-energizing regional tourism because uh, during my um, uh, time as a minister, in particular uh, during last year, we have started uh, just before COVID uh, to come, we have started um, uh, different projects together with Greece, with Romania, with Turkey, uh, with uh, Republic of North Macedonia, Serbia, all our neighbors to present the Balkan region as one a very good uh, touristic region, in particular for the long-term destination. And I think that here will be our strength to focus when we would like also to attract investment. Because I agree that in tourism, uh, the 90, more than 90 percent of, uh, of the companies that are working in tourism are small and medium enterprises and micro enterprises in the in the smallest uh, regions uh, in each country. And in particular, this is uh, in Bulgaria that that's the truth. And we need to encourage those people to continue working, uh, particularly facing these uh, uh, difficulties now with the travel restrictions, with the vaccination challenge uh, here in, in uh, Rila Hotel, where I am now, uh, all the personnel is vaccinated. And I'm very happy to say that because this means that all the tourists that we are going to welcome now through the winter season when it starts, they will feel comfortable and safety. And we have to accept the, the, uh, the new reality after COVID. Uh, yes, we need to come back to the level of arrivals before 2019, but with improved quality of the product, with a new rebranding, uh, common efforts. Because like this, we will be able to achieve much more. And here, the role of the government is crucial, supporting the sector in these difficult times. Thank you, Nicolina. Um, I want to go to, to the Maldives, and your story, Toya, is, is really quite interesting because you, you have actually done pretty well during COVID, if I can say that in, in an appropriate way. I think you've had 90% of your tourism or something really high um, going on, and you specifically did well with ultra high net worth tourists. Can you just elaborate on... on if you think that is going to be the policy for the future, and how much then, in which case, does the lo do the local people benefit from this? Um, um, especially during the pandemic, I, I will start. Uh, I represent Visit Maldives, and uh, what we did was we, we, we started researching, researching what could be done together with the industry partners. We, we are from the government, look, uh, and we didn't see government as one and the private sector as uh, so what we found out was sustainability is one key factor we have to look into. I mean, even in a crisis, um, when crisis hit, nobody knew what to do next. Still, we are struggling, and we will be living with it uh, next year, probably. But, but to answer your question, yes, high net worth individuals want to travel, but there are certain things we have to look into. We have to see what are our geographical advantages we, which we could take probably in branding, especially. What we found out during the pandemic was we found that everybody is looking for a safer haven. 
Everybody wants to get out, definitely. They're sick of staying in their countries. So what they are looking into is safe, safe protocols and safety guidelines are there in place. So we, what we did was we made sure there's, it's, there is a stringent safety measures put in place and we only had lockdowns for three months. After that, we opened up last year, July 15th, our borders were open. That was a bold move up by our president. And we were the first, one of the first, Dubai was the first, I think. Yeah, and from then, we never had to lock down again. Of course, there were stringent measures. People, the, um, our, uh, the staff of uh, the tourism sector was given the priority for vaccination. Yep. And 90, over 98% is vac fully vaccinated now, giving an assurance for the, not only high net worth uh, individuals, not only the premium uh, tourists, everybody who really want to get out and have some fun, some traveling together. Uh, and you have to take that advantage. We had that blessing of isolated islands, thousands of islands, and the unique uh, one island, one resort concept worked so well and we kept constantly that message. We have one island, one resort, and that gives uh, an edge. And it's a, it, the words itself says it's a safe haven. Mm. But of course, every country will have their own advantages, which I think should be identified and taken care of and taken full advantage as well. Well, I want to, because I know we're running out of time, but I, w I want to ask all of you, and I'll come to D Dimitris first, just to, just to sum up his next. I want to ask all of you, in a way, if you had to sum up, post-COVID, what are the attractions of being, and I won't, obviously you, you, you don't come from a particular country, and I'm going to be interested in know the Mediterranean, but what would be the post-pandemic, if you'd like, if it is ever post-pandemic, attraction of going to your particular country? Um, and your particular region, because that's to do, in a sense, with post-pandemic branding. Uh, Dimitrios, so it brings me back to you, and the whole idea of a new kind of branding in this new climate that we're in, what, what is that, can, can you see that changing for, um, and different to what was going on in 2019? I think what, what you see, Rajan, is people are so keen to travel and they would like to explore different places that right now, uh, they are looking to what is safe, where can I, can I go and how can I enjoy things. But also I think we really need to look into the fact that a lot of people uh, discovered uh, domestic destinations through staycation. And one of the things that we're going to see is that a lot of people will be taking domestic holidays. This is really good for uh, large countries, but smaller countries and insular places will, will suffer from that. I think going back to what we were saying earlier, it's really about can you create transformational experience that will enable people to have a fantastic time and you give them value for time first and value for money second. And I think that is really what's going to be driving the reopening and the, uh, 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 the re-energization of, of tourism destinations. Thank you. Um, let me go to you first then, then Andrew. I mean, obviously you cover a region. But in terms of why would you go to the Mediterranean in today's society, and you know, what, how you, in today's climate, how, in terms of branding again, yeah, how is that shifting? In fact, this question we have asked ourselves too a couple of months ago when we're looking ahead, because of course you, you cannot just stop there and address and, and firefight, but you need to look ahead too. Mm. And we identified two objectives, service excellence. I think as Dimitrios was mentioning and even the, the other panelists, the, 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 the type of tourists, the, the requirements are changing. So we need to be ahead, listen to them, have a good feel of what's happening and what they're requiring and focus on service excellence. So that, that's the first objective. The second point, of course, is safety. Yeah. Towards this end, bringing them together, we created a product, a tool which we are uh, promoting across the destinations in the Mediterranean to create a movement, a collective movement, uh, which we call the Star Journey. Uh, a journey because, of course, it will take time. We need to look ahead. We look at, uh, look at, at the future over more than one year. And star, why star? S, safety. We're distributing free software 
to hotels to help them manage uh, the protocols uh, related to COVID, but not just COVID, but in relation to safety as a general term. Um, uh, and those hotels who will be using this software to help them to manage the situation will be certified by Forbes Travel Guide um, as, verified, as verified hotels. If 50% of these hotel, of hotels in a destination, particular destinations, adopt the software, then it will be the destination who will also be certified as such. T of the star, training, because training is, is of course, is, 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 is more important more, more than ever before. A, accommodation, targeting the hotels. We are offering mystery guest audits so that we give feedback to the hoteliers of how, where they can improve and where they need to re-engineer their processes. And the same thing applies to the restaurants, the R of the star. Thank you very much. Um, Nicolina, um, in terms of yep. the, the Balkan offer, if you like, which you've just been talking about, is there a new branding that you are going to be going into post-pandemic? Well, the post-pandemic uh, will, uh, will be connected with first uh, safety, clear rules to travel, because the, new, the travelers are very demanding now and uh, everyone wants to travel, but wants to travel in a place where uh, rules are clear, the, the safety is assured, a great quality, a perfect service, and of course, uh, untapped potential to be discovered, connected with the local traditions and culture. And I think all this could be offered by the Balkan countries here, and in particular in Bulgaria, because we are a jewelry that needs to be discovered after the new reality post-COVID. With, uh, as I said, the great hospitality we are famous of, and the natural uh, and the local uh, culture uh, and traditions. Thank you. Minister, what, what would you say in terms of Sierra Leone, post-pandemic, well, um, new branding? Two things. Uh, one is building a safe, secured and peaceful destination. That is so, so important. In the area of COVID, when you get into the country, for instance, when you get into Sierra Leone, you go through the PCR test too at the airport, you go, and it, then you wait for 15 minutes, you go home, and then they send your results. There is no nightmare about um, extraordinary cost. And I think a lot of people have become weird of some destinations because of that. And I think that is critical. The second is coming out of pandemic and then trying to build narratives around opportunities, I think is key. Now we all know that the old narrative about tourism is about, we have beautiful beaches, we have ecotourism, we have cultural, blah, 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 we have historical, that's the old narrative. I think it's time for tourism to develop and propagate new development narratives. I think that's the way I'm saying it, which means that Let's take, for example, what are the connecting narratives between tourism, climate change, green energy? Yeah. You know, so I think we need to move a little bit from the traditional, I call it the traditional idiosyncratic thinking. We need to move into the narratives around building tourism, looking at the green economy, trying to look at climate change, because if you look at what is happening in all of those areas, it is directly attacking tourism. It's juxtaposing and attacking tourism, which means what you have, which you want to market, is what the impact of climate change is destroying. Yep. So how do we get interesting narratives around this kind of things? And positive narratives is what you're saying exactly. about, about tourism. Yeah. And then, of course, narratives around the blue economy itself. How do we try to bring that in narratives around things like agro-tourism, you know, narratives on the business environment. So because what I see is that, my assessment is that over the decades, the narrative on tourism has just been on the tangibles. Yeah. There's need to move the narrative from just the tangible to the intangible, but connecting it with development trajectory. So which means that we have more interesting things to talk about our rebranding. Yeah. That uh, we are doing this tourism, we are also attacking plastic recycling. Yeah. 
We are talking about paper bags. Yeah. I mean, we are talking about how do we get people in coastal communities who depend on things like sand mining, yeah. who depend on charcoal burning. How do we get alternatives in SME? How do we get this kind of thing? How do we, yeah. you know, it's, it's bring, I mean, yeah. so, so this is a whole thing. Those people who are in the higher education, in tourism, yeah. I think there is so much work to do. But notwithstanding, we the practitioners, I think there is need for us to start to link. And with, with the COVID, coming to the post-pandemic, these are the narratives the world is looking for. Yeah. So I think, for me, that is a very, very uh, important I think you've point. Actually, yeah, thank you. I think you've raised an interesting point there, which is I've always felt, I don't know how you feel this, that re or just recently felt, that the, tra the world of travel and tourism has not slightly been on the back foot when it comes to the climate change issue particularly and COP26 is happening right yeah. now yeah. and there seems to be a sense of responsibility in the travel sector yeah. to, to, to accept yes okay we are guilty well, of, of the, a little bit of this and, we've got to, and we want to do something about it and the way yes. to change as you say the perception is to take over the issue in other words take the narrative and say guess what travel and tourism is a force for sustainability possibly the greatest force for sustainability and then you take over that mantle. I mean, that is really a, a positive narrative. As you say, it's all about the narrative. I think Change that's, narratives. Yeah. This is an opportunity. Yeah. I, I totally Post pandemic understand. narratives. Yeah. How it's, I mean, this with many different issues, not only climate change. Yeah. Issues around education, you know, issues around poverty reduction, which has always been there. There are some that have been there. But yeah. how do we translate all of this, you know, so that um, the local people, see themselves in what we are talking about. Because we should note that a lot of people in our countries don't travel. Yeah. They depend on domestic tourism. But how do we get them to be interested in the conversations and help the country to grow? Sure, sure. You know? Thank yeah. you. Okay. Narrative for you, obviously, the narrative has been good in a sense during the worst period of COVID for, for um, the Maldives. People, as you said, every island's a resort. People go there, they feel safe. The, f the future, the future narrative for, for you? Sustainability, yeah. environment conscious travelers are coming up. The millennials, although there are many, they look for sustainability, environment conscious. And uh, of course, uh, safety, hygiene measures, they are very, very critical now. And that, uh, due, due to the pandemic, it, it came up. And it, has, it is one of the most important things that's coming up. And I will wrap up. I know it's getting a long day. So hygiene, um, ease of commun com commuting as well. And I think um, the experiences matters. They will be looking at experiences, uh, local life, local food, local culture. Everything matters. That's it. Thank you. OK, that is the opportunity. In terms of marketing, in terms of branding, assume the, the, the front role, the, 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 the pioneering role in making sustainability part of, of the narrative and actually rather than feeling defensive and embarrassed about travel, say it is a force for good as um, you know, we've always been, to, we've been talking about a lot today. Um, so Taleb, would, would, I think would totally agree with that, that, that that is exactly the role that uh, tourism should play. So, well, thank you. That's a positive note, I think, which is a very good thing to end on for the day. Um, Dimitrios, Nicolina, Toyeb, Minister, yes, oh, you, I knew maybe you wanted to say something, go on, go on. <laughs> Last, I think. Yeah. I think uh, the takeaway is the most important thing, life goes on. I don't think so because a blessing in the disguise, I've seen in many countries, people have discovered their own country. All right, so that's a good part. Even in England, I've seen yep. the last 40 years, I have not been able to go to places where I was supposed to. So now I've gone, I've traveled, I've seen places. But what I'm saying, the most important thing is that training, skill development for quality, we need vocational training center. This is where the SMEs can play an important role because quality Vocational training center, nobody talks about it. I mean, Africa being there, it's a, it's, a, it's a land of opportunity. But they need vocational training center. You really don't need huge investment. But people will come there. If you show them quality, 
and quality will come through skill development. For skill development, you need vocational training center. So I think this is where the main emphasis should be. Okay, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you. Po tourism as a force for good is a great way to end today. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you for two of you over there. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rajan. Bye-bye.